Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier, joined as always by my co-host, Nick Filato. Today's podcast is going to be a little bit different. Obviously, the Giants played on Christmas, and we did not record on Christmas night. Uh, obviously, you know, for a multitude of reasons there. So today, we are going to do a podcast that's kind of all-encompassing. It'll be a little bit of film, takeaways, we'll run some tape, uh, probably no film breakdowns, just some takeaways. Talk some overall arching points. I want to get into about this team and this team's future and talk about the Eagles Giants game, the week 16 game where the Giants kind of almost won that game. I guess uh, they had yes. a chance to win it at the end. Um, I never felt like they were going to win it. It's one of those games, but they did have a chance to technically win the game at the end. Some really uh, inexcusable miscues from the Eagles, in my opinion, fumbling a kickoff return inside their own 10 and then the pick six while they were in the Giants. Well, in the Renzo and going to score against the Giants, but gave the Giants a chance. Um, and so, where do you want to start today, Nick? Uh, on the let, let's start maybe on the Eagles Giants game. Some of your key takeaways from that before, maybe before the tape. So close, thirty-three to twenty-five. Look, the New York Giants—they came out with some fight. I thought it could have been a slaughter, right? Like it could have been like a custard's last stand type of situation going into Philadelphia with Tommy DeVito, and I felt like Tommy DeVito left a lot of meat on the bone. I appreciated that he got benched at halftime for Tyrod Taylor to provide a spark. I guess you could say it provided a spark, albeit it was a little bit awkward because it's not like the offense really got going other than that Darius Slayton deep pass. It was mainly just Isaiah Simmons who shoved Olamade Zacchaeus into, into Boston Scott, which I love, by the way, Boston Scott fumbling the football, and then yeah. Adoree Jackson taking advantage of Dallas Goddard who lost his footing on an out route for that pick six. I would have loved to see the upset. I really would have. I hate the Eagles, but grand scheme of things, it's better for the Giants trap position at this point. Now I think they are back in the top five. I think they're selecting five. I think I saw that on Tankathon. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Overall takeaways though is Wink Martindale got really creative. I appreciate it. Sometimes when you do get creative, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be good. I think the run defense, even though they, I think they surrendered 170 something yards, which it's been worse in the past. But when DeAndre Swift and Kenneth Gainwell wanted to run, they did. I have some just like really poor notes on, on Kayvon Thibodeau as a run defender, Azizo Jolari as a run defender. I, I liked how the Giants on defense tried to get Isaiah Simmons a little bit more involved to get speed on the football field. My main takeaway on the defensive side of the football, though, would be just guarding this Eagles team is, is so freaking difficult. I don't know how you do it. It, it. it is very, very difficult to do. And the Giants have not really been a great run fitting team. Uh, since Wink got here outside of how they improved on counter gap with Bobby Okereke and, and uh, Micah McFadden. But against these these mobile quarterbacks, man, they just they just really struggle. And, and Kayvon Thibodeau as the read defender in this game specifically, yeah. he was taken advantage of quite often. This was probably the worst game that I've seen of Kayvon Thibodeau since he was maybe even a professional, but definitely this season. Yeah, that's where I want to start there. It was what I would consider to be Kayvon's worst game definitively for me. And also just a weird game, I thought, from Kayvon. It felt like, and multiple times he looked gassed on the field. I felt like that last drive the Eagles had, um, or the drive after the Giants scored uh, the, the Tyrod Taylor bomb touchdown, the entire defense just looked gassed to me completely. Just out of breath, out of energy, on the field too often. Um, Kayvon you know, as that read defender did not have a great game. And in general, I just think he wasn't great in this game. Obviously the stats bear it out as well. Not much from him from a pressure standpoint. I'm trying to get the number right now for Tibbs. Tibbs was, well, he had three total pressures, but you know, that was on, let's see, a uh, 31 pass rush snaps. So, so not very good there. And obviously, you know, even worse when it comes to kind of against the run in this game from Kayvon Thibodeau. You hate to see that, Nick. You hate to see such a strong second season from Thibodeau that was gaining a lot of hype for good reason around the midseason point when he had reached that that double digit sack mark for the first time any defender had under Wink Martindale in a while, if not ever, maybe um, might be ever. And then to have it kind of lose steam like this, because you want to go into the, even though I do believe every season is a new one and I'm not personally a big believer in carrying over momentum. I still like to go into an offseason with the feeling that a uh, player's trajectory is going upward. Um, and I'm not so sure we can feel that way with Kayvon right now or Aziz Ojolari, who you mentioned as well. Um, who just I just think it was a bad game for Kayvon. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. there. I just think it was a bad game, and I think it's a tough I don't assignment. I think he was great last game, though, either, or the last hmm. few games is kind of where yeah. I don't think he was as bad as this by any the, means. But. The Saints' game plan, though, was to eliminate Kayvon. Mm -hmm. Now, there were a couple 
plays in this game against the Eagles where they had a tight end who helped chip. For me, it was more the run defense and not even just as a read defender. Being the read defender is difficult. You know, you're put into yeah. a, a conflict position. You have to make a decision. And excellent players like Miles Garrett and Micah Parsons, they can they can rise above that. Kayvon Thibodeau is not quite there yet, and that's fine. But also, you just saw him glued to blocks. There were a couple plays against yeah. like Jack Stoll and, and he's backup tight ends, Grant Calcaterra, who's like uprooting him. And, and getting him out of position. And, and it's just at that point, maybe it's like, is he scared that Jalen Hurts had the football and he, and he had to like shade to the outside, which left the B gap more open. I'm not entirely sure, but it, it o- overall and all encompassing, I came away just being like, ah, damn, man. And just from a run defense standpoint, I think Kayvon Thibodeau has been a much better than what we saw. And with Aziz, look, Aziz Ojolari isn't a great run defender. And, and that's, that's fine. I think one of the big things heading into the offseason the Giants need to explore, and this is something that we've brought up in the past, is you got to find another edge rusher. Now, sure. I would love for Aziz Ojolari, and I think he can be a starter, but I would love for the Giants to find a young edge rusher to pair with Kayvon Thibodeau, and you could put Aziz Ojolari into that pass rushing specialist mode where I think he would absolutely kill. doesn't mean he doesn't have to play on first down, but now you can have an actual rotation instead of uh, relying on these two and then Jihad Ward or or whoever else you're going to put out there. Tamon Fox was out there, I believe. Like, like a bunch of players where you're just like, oh shit, he's back on the team? Cool. Boogie right. Basham, where did he go? You know, it's just, it's uh, it's been a it's been a mess at uh, overall for the Giants this entire season. And the edge room can be grouped into that. Although I will say, I don't believe Kayvon Thibodeau is, is, is lost steam. I just think this is, was a disappointing performance. Yeah, I guess, I mean... Lost steam can be, you know, viewed yeah, yeah, that's true. In a bunch of different ways, I feel like he had a lot of steam earlier this year, but it is what it is. I'm more concerned with things like the run defense taking a little bit of a step back. It feels like in this last half, though. Again, a lot of it to me seems like there are times where it's just gassed on the field because they've been mm-hmm. on the field so much. Um, so on that side of the ball, I was thinking about that and the Giants' defensive line. The other side of the ball, I was considering the decision to go to Tyrod Taylor in the second half, and yeah, Taylor did not have his best game one you know he's rusty as hell two he didn't have reps with the first team offense this week and yet once he kind of started to get going and get those reps and he missed the waller throw and he missed the barkley throw he came out with an explosive touchdown throw that quite frankly i don't really think any quarterback besides him on this roster is making i know other people will point to a few throws that have happened over the years i don't know how many of them have been led into space i'm still waiting for the day day where a wide receiver is going to consistently run under a throw for the Giants like Slayton did on that touchdown pass. And I want to see more throws where our receivers are kind of r- running under them. The ball's being led into space. The ball is, you know, thrown with a trajectory so the receiver can run under it and then, you know, trot into the end zone. And I thought that throw was an amazing explosive throw by Tyrod Taylor to give the Giants kind of a spark and a chance to maybe compete in this game. Without this play, the Giants have no shot in this game. That's pretty obvious. It was a 70-yard touchdown throw, their longest of the season by far. Um, And they were obviously not going to be driving down the field for a touchdown at that point. I think everyone realizes that. It's a beautiful throw. The Eagles defense sucks, by the way. Like it's this bad Eagles, right now. yeah. This Eagles team in general, that they not are going not anywhere. Honest. No, no, not the way they're playing. Their offense is it. It, now we're going to get a cold take for that if they end up winning the Super Bowl. So yes, they could still play better than they have in the last four or five weeks. But as of the last four or five weeks, their defense looks horrible. Their offense doesn't seem like they're on the same page either. Right. And that's an issue. Now they have explosive elements and Jalen Hurts is an absolute superstar. So maybe they can overcome some of those issues. But on defense, they've been having a ton of issues. But again, man, the 49ers just got their ass kicked at home. So if the Eagles can get hot in the next couple of games, we can see what happens. Hopefully not, though, for our sake. But this is an absolutely beautiful throw if you're watching on YouTube from Tyrod Taylor like you laid out. And I love this concept, dude. This is a quarters concept. Jonathan Gannon, when he was the defensive coordinator, he used right. a lot of the quarters types of concepts. And you're going to run... First, Darren Waller, who is basically in line. He's in a two-point stance. He's close to the tackle. He's on the hash. And then you have a stack just at the top of the numbers. And I love the route concept. This is good coaching. Again, look, you're going to run Waller to the flat, and then you're going to release Wandell Robinson inside of the apex, or he's going to take a step to the inside, and then he's going to flare to the outside, which is going to draw the eyes of the deep fourth defender, the cornerback. Now, look, if that deep fourth defender bites on Wandell Robinson, which he is going to do, Reed Blankenship is the guy who's going to have to guard Darius Slayton right. on a deep corner, on a deep flag route. Like, that's just so difficult for Reed Blankenship. He's on the hash, and he's going up against Darius Slayton, a much better athlete who's in much better position. Great X's and O's, and I love how Tyrod diagnosed this and, and fired the football because the quarterbacks in this game, Dan, I mean, they 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 missed a lot of throws, both Tyrod Taylor and 
and uh, Tommy DeVito. Now, the thing about Tyrod, the one to Saquon, yes, it was underthrown. The, the one to Waller was very difficult. He had to turn yeah. against the grain and then try right. to try to release the football with Hassan Reddick right on his ass, right? Like, that's that's a very difficult assignment to have. But you had a bunch of misses from Tommy DeVito as well. You had the Waller slant in the first quarter. This you had was the slate. worst game from DeVito mm-hmm. to me by far. And you know what it was, too? It wasn't just, like, inaccurate throws. It was not pulling the trigger. That was the problem yes. in this game, especially on the quick passing Second guessing concepts. himself. Second Constantly. guessing himself. There were a couple different quick game passes on, like, first and 10 that could have got the ball rolling and could have set up uh, – the drive for the giants where he just wasn't pulling the trigger at all. And he would just scan the field and then try to run or something, pick up a couple yards. It was the worst game we saw from, from him. And then Tyrod just had a couple of those misses, but the Waller one, man, that's, that's a difficult throw. Yeah, it was a tough throw. Um, I think he was a little rusty though, for sure. The beginning. Yeah. Um, I don't think it to me is even a debate who gives the giants a better chance to win right now. Tyrod Taylor, yeah. or Tommy DeVito. I know we discussed this before the pod, so I can say confidently that Nick agrees with me on that. The answer is Tyrod Taylor. I also think for me, Nick, I'm past the point of, of thinking that Tommy DeVito really has any value to this roster. If I'm going to be honest, long-term and I, and you could get mad at me for that, but it's just an opinion. Am I allowed to have opinions? I think that's the point of the show and not you, Nick. I mean, the people listening, yeah, I know. in my opinion, I don't really see much long-term value to him. I think he's been exposed. He's been figured out. Um, you know, he, his best games are always going to come the first eight before def- defense coordinators get tape on him. That was the case with Davis Mills, Daniel Jones, every quarterback, basically in the history of football, except for the great ones who adjust to what the defensive coordinators adjust to them and take away the things they like. Um, as DCs have taken away the things that Tommy DeVito likes conceptually, there's really been no response. I think his processing is slow. I don't love his arm. I don't love his size. I don't love his mobility. Uh, there's not too much for me to bank on. If I'm going to go for a long-term developmental quarterback. I don't just need a guy who grinded out a win against the Patriots when his team had three turnovers and the Patriots missed a field goal and field goal range and threw a pick and field goal range or won a game where, you know, the defense, the Giants defense against Washington had six turnovers. That's not what I'm looking for wins. I'm looking for developmental traits. I want traits. I want arm talent, mobility, processing from a mental standpoint, pocket manipulation. That's what I want for development at quarterback, not winning a random football game against shit teams like Washington and Patriots. So for me, I'm looking for traits and I'd rather go to a different well for this. So when the question ultimately comes, Nick, this off season, because the Giants are probably going to have three quarterbacks on the roster, Daniel Jones, Tommy DeVito, and somebody new, either via free agency or a rookie. This is something even Joe Shane confirmed that his bi-week presser. I don't really want to carry three quarterbacks and worry about Tommy and keeping him on the roster. It was a fun story, I guess, for when it lasted. They beat some shitty teams, but you know, now now that story to me is, is, is personally over. And that's my opinion. And, I, and it's okay to not share that, by the way. No, I don't I don't fully share that opinion. Uh, I wouldn't say it's over. He's still an undrafted kid. He, he has a shot. And with the Giants right now, I mean Daniel Jones. I don't mean over from that standpoint. I mean over from my my thought that he can be a long term backup for the Giants. Oh, I still don't even think it's over from from that standpoint yet. And I think it's also interesting because no, 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 not over from from what the Giants might do, Nick. Over from what I believe. Yeah, yeah, I I got you. Okay, I got you. Yeah, and so So for you, you believe it yes, yes, yeah. Okay, that's what I'm I'm trying to say. And uh, the thing is, right now with Daniel Jones, he could land on the pup, right? Like. You might True. need Tommy. They DeVito. might need him from that stand. Okay. So, I mean, again, that that doesn't have anything, any kind of effect on on your opinion, still. Sure. But uh, I I, uh, I do think he could still be something. I mean, there's a lot of bad quarterback play. I'm not saying he's going to come in and win the Giants a Super Bowl, but can he run scout team? Yeah, he can run yeah, scout sure. team. And can he spot start if you need him, or can he come in and maybe provide a little spark for you? Sure. There's like a lot of bad quarterback play as we've seen, and this kid is still in his first year, so I'm not willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater or whatever kind of cliche saying that, that, that we want to say about Tommy DeVito, but yeah, that magic is definitely gone. Like the Tommy cutlets and things like that. Yeah. That's, that's certainly over right now. Yeah. But I, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say it like this, Nick, for me, the reason I've kind of turned the page on it is just history of quarterbacks after DCs get tape on them. And then also this stat, I mean, the Packers defense over the last three weeks has given up 851 yards, a 72.9% completion rate, seven touchdowns and zero interceptions with a quarterback rating of 132 to Tommy DeVito, Baker Mayfield, and Bryce Young. 
Bryce Young being on that yeah. list. So it just reminds me a lot of that Minnesota game. And, and if we if we try to overestimate it again, what it might mean or, you know, one game against a bad defense, what it might mean. It just feels it, it feels it feels likelier to me that Tommy DeVito is not your long term backup QB, two, or yeah, at least not one that I want to bank on. Moving yeah, forward. that's that. Yeah, that could easily be the case as well. And one thing, if we want to talk about Tommy DeVito and some of his shortcomings and just the Giants overall game plan against the Eagles, he's still like has thrown what, like five passes over the middle of the field. He can't like, throw. He can't see the middle of the field at all. He can't process it. He whatsoever. can't process it. Yeah. And the Giants entire offensive game plan here was zone read to Saquon Barkley he sprinkled yeah. in a couple counter runs Some with screens being the fullback and then screens and stuff outside the numbers. And yeah. I love that he's throwing from the pocket outside the numbers. But if that's all you're throwing and you're not attempting over the field, then you're not using every blade of grass. So that's something that right. I would like to see him rectify. But again, if the Giants want to attempt to beat the Rams or attempt to beat the Eagles at MetLife, I think the best course for that would be Tyrod Taylor, would be the veteran who has had a proclivity to target down the field, who will target over the middle of the field as well and can create explosive plays and is a better athlete than DeVito. Yeah, all those things. I will say this. I, I want to be fair to Tommy. There are some things he's done well, I think, on tape um, outside of just that Green Bay game because, again, I that Green Bay matchup is a tough one for me. It's so easy, but it's. I think he does it solid job of not bailing right from pockets for a lot of, a lot of the plays and that's something Jalen Hurts by the way I tweeted about this yesterday Nick you know after Nick Bosa put that out there like we know how to beat the book is out on Jalen Hurts you just gotta not give him the b gap to run through and you gotta try to make him bail right from the pocket it I saw that a lot against the Giants especially in the first half from Jalen Hurts and that's something I give Tevito credit for I saw some good examples over the last four weeks of Tevito where he you know would would reset the pocket he'd stay within the pocket it's always better if you end up resetting the pocket finding your new launch point from within that pocket because it gives you both sides of the field you can throw anywhere from that point when you roll right to bail which is something Daniel Jones had a big problem doing this year and all of his career except for the 2022 season you just cut off half the field that way. And then all the routes are breaking back toward the quarterback. And guess who else is breaking back toward the quarterback? Every defender on that side of the field and every defender who was maybe not on that side of the field is also moving in that direction. So it's just not a good plan long-term to do that. And so I do want to give DeVito credit. I think he's done a solid job compared to what I've seen from most Giants quarterbacks of, you know, staying within the pocket, resetting it and manipulating it in that way. Yeah. And you got to keep everything in the, context here like this is still a very young quarterback who's only starting yep. what is like fifth game or yep. something so yes the magic is over right now and it probably should be tie rod time but that has not been confirmed yet by brian dable as of tuesday in his press conference but it's a short week we'll see who's getting this tip of the cap against the rams and uh sean mcveigh who i think might have a little bit of fun with wink martindale's defense what's going on big blue banter listeners I'm excited for the football season for several reasons, and one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform, and it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. Make Little Caesars, the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, part of your game day. There are a few things better in the world than kicking back, watching some football, and biting into some delicious Little Caesars pizza. Order online during our Pizza Pizza pregame 
one hour before and three hours after NFL kickoffs, plus all day on Sunday. And get ready for some football and fun. Choose your favorite Little Caesars pizza or pick the toppings you crave. Old world pepperoni, pepperoni, extra cheese, Italian sausage, olives, onions, pineapple if you're into that. Put it on half the pie, the entire pie. There are so many other options that I don't have time to name. Slap that on a round crust, a thin crust, a stuffed crust, a Detroit style deep dish. Either way, you win. And speaking of winning, everyone scores with convenient delivery or our in-store pizza portal pickup. So grab some friends and enjoy a few slices during the game. There's also the financial factor when it comes to the decision the Giants are going to have to make, whether it be go with Tyra Taylor or Tommy DeVito, because in Taylor's contract, uh, it contains playing time and performance incentives. According to Dan Duggan, he'd be in line to earn an additional one million if he started the final five games. And here's how the incentives are down 40 to 49 percent of the snaps for the season would be an extra 250 K 50 to 59% would be 250 K. He's at 25.7%. This was back on December 11th. That number has obviously blown, grown a little bit. Um, but it looks like he's going to have a tough time getting to that 50% number. I'm not sure if he can get to the 40% number, but he can also earn 250,000 extra for a 92.5 passer rating. Uh, if he gets to a minimum of 224 attempts and 92.1 with just 87 attempts and an additional 250 K if he can get to a 65% completion rate. Um, and he currently, had, this was back then he had a 65.5% back on December 11th. This was when they made the decision to stick. And with he's still tell. airing it out, man. I'd be checked down Charlie. If that were the case yeah, to get that 250 K <laughs> I know. Right. I, I might be too. I might be considering that myself. If I was, if we meant $250,000, that's a lot of money, um, but maybe not as much to ask pro athletes. Who knows? To us, it feels great. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious what will happen there as far as if that plays any role, but the giants aren't typically that type of team. Nick, I know the Raiders did it last year with Derek Carr. Um, the Giants are not typically the type of team that really worries about that kind of stuff. So we'll see what happens there. But it'll be something to track this week. Will they go back to Taylor? I ultimately think the Giants will uh, start Tyrod Taylor against the Rams. Yeah, I think so, too. But if we want to talk a little bit more about this matchup and and defending this team, this team's in our division. We're not sure if Wink Martindale's going to be back, but we have another game in, in two weeks against True. this opponent. Man, bro, defending Jalen Hurts and this, this team is difficult. The Giants were running out there in like 5-0, five down lineman type of fronts. And what were the Eagles doing? Okay, I'm just going to throw outside the numbers. Oh, here's an out route to Devonta Smith. Oh, here's an out route to Dallas Goddard. Oh, we have a single high safety. Let me try to take a deep shot to whichever one of these two guys are open. And then when the Giants tried to counter that, they would just spread them out, spread the Giants out, and then just run the football with the zone read. It. And it's just... When you have a quarterback who creates that extra gap that you need to account for and he holds that backside and man mm -hmm. on the line of scrimmage in place, it just removes that one defender. And when you have an offensive line with, they didn't have Landon Dickerson, but Kelsey, who didn't even have that great of a game, but still would be the best center tape I've ever seen from a New York Giant if he was a New York Giant, even though uh -huh. he still didn't have that great of a game, right? When you have all of those factors clicking for you, your offense is it's at such an advantage against so many different defenses is specifically this defense too. And our defense, we have some guys up front. We have linebackers who can actually fit the run. Now our safeties aren't inept filling the alley, but Holy crap, man. Some of those double teams that are just fantastic. And then I look at the opposite side of the football. I see Jordan Davis, man, that guy's hard to move, bro. Like the, with some of those double teams, there was one drive, I think with the giants where, where they were running just inside zone, zone read and things like that. And it, we're getting up to the second level. Saquon Barkley sprung a couple runs. Some of those linebackers, not, not as much Darius Leonard, but the, but the other one that they put in there, I think 57 was his number. <laughs> a little bit late to fill a couple times. The allowing... linebackers are bad. Yeah. You know? They're in like a Giants-esque linebacker yeah. type situation this season. They, they, they were down both their linebackers. So Zach Cunningham and Nicholas Morrow did not yeah. play in the game. So if those guys were there, I mean, maybe it would have been a little bit better. But I felt like Saquon Barkley, oh, oh, you give him a sliver. And if you're just a little bit hesitant as a linebacker, good luck trying to catch up to him. So the Giants were able to spring a couple nice runs through that. But all in all, man, this, this entire game is just disappointing. This entire season has been disappointing. One thing that wasn't disappointing, though, I know I'm jumping around a little bit here, Jordan Riley. Mm -hmm. Jordan Riley had a, had a rep against Jason Kelsey that I put up on Twitter where you could see he controls Kelsey with his inside hand. He gets double teamed. The guard ends up leaving, and, and uh, Riley is on the inside shade part of Kelsey away from the guard double team. And you could see how Riley is controlling Kelsey with that inside hand, stacks him, tosses him aside, 
makes a tackle. That's a seventh round pick, Dan, mm. that legitimately might be starting next to Dexter Lawrence next year. He has a real shot, I think, if you keep giving him reps and he keeps producing like this. It's not perfect. Like There are times where double teams take him off the line of scrimmage. I don't want to act like he's Dexter Lawrence out here, but this could be a seventh round contributor. And that that's not something that we've seen a lot over the last decade and a half as Giant fans. No, it's not. And it's a, it's a really positive development for the Giants and something that makes me consider, you know, if I were in the Giants position, would I consider the fact that, you know, how much value do we assign to the development of these players based on their coaches? For example, Andre Patterson, Giants yes. coach, responsible for Jordan Riley, who's flashed on film, responsible for DJ Davidson, who's flashed on film. These are both seventh round picks or no, Davidson was a fifth, but yes. late round day three picks. He somewhat responsible, at least for Dexter Lawrence, going from a very good football player to arguably the best defensive player in football or damn near close. And, you know, you flip that to the other side of it. And if you're if you're a Giants general manager or in the regime and making decisions, well, do you ask yourselves why guys have developed so strongly under Patterson, despite two of them not even having high draft capital, late investments in Jordan Riley and DJ Jameson? And then you got the flip side of that, which is guys like Azudu early development. And I think he got an unfair deal having to play left tackle this year. I but Evan Neal, John Michael Schmitz, who quite frankly has not been that great on film. Right, let's be honest about the situation. He's been fine, if we're, but it hasn't been great. And then you ask yourself, and Andrew Thomas has been amazing, but that he was amazing before Bobby Johnson got here. So you ask yourself, you know, what are we going to assign to the value of the coaching and development? How much are we going to assign to it? Because it certainly seems like in the Andre Patterson case, it's made a big difference. And it almost certainly feels like in the reverse of this, the Bobby Johnson case, it's made a big difference as well. So I wonder, and then obviously you can get to just the special teams for the Giants, yeah, which geez, is just, man. it just seems like the Giants have six to 10 games a year affected by special teams in a negative way, which yeah, is just. I, look, man. I don't like to sit on the podcast in this public forum and bash McGahey because I can't necessarily opine on how to fix it because I don't know enough about special teams, frankly. Same. But I'll say this. It's been pretty bad for a while and something's got to change. And I think anybody can say that, right? My mom doesn't watch football. She could say that. So something's got to give at that point. Bobby Johnson, I'm not in the room. We made that clear on this podcast. We try to be fair to him. None of these young guys are developing. Then no. to your point, Andre Patterson, they're all developing. Jerome Henderson, I think he's, and I haven't evaluated all the coaches in the NFL. He has to be one of the better defensive back coaches in the league because this dates back to Joe Judge's time where he got the most out of Jabril Peppers. He got the most out of James Bradbury. He got the most out of a Dory Jackson, right? And he's doing the same thing now. He's getting a lot out of Xavier McKinney with a different type of system that is much more unique than a lot of other systems in the NFL. And he's still being adaptive and thriving, in my opinion, within that system. I wish we had a better game from Cordell Flott, who I felt like had a little bit of an off game, got burnt by Devonta Smith on that 30, what, five yard touchdown or whatever it was. Looked terrible on that play. Yeah, it's tough, man. Man coverage and the safety yeah. flowed hard aggressively over the top of AJ Brown, which the Giants were doing. The Giants did so much rotating in this game. Like Jahad Ward, I, I can look it up. How many times did Jahad Ward drop into coverage in this game? It was a seven times, but I felt like it was a lot. And there were a couple plays. That is a lot. <laughs> it, it is, but not for not necessarily for for Wink Martindale. There were a couple plays where Jahad Ward dropped like twelve yards deep. I'm like, holy crap, man! He's so deep. The Giants put. Put up uh, Kayvon Thibodeau over the center on a couple of plays. They had this weird chimney formation, I think is what Dan Duggan called it, where it was like Dexter Lawrence, Kayvon Thibodeau, and like two other giants were stacked up by the yeah, center. We saw that one last year. Yeah. 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 We did see it last year too. I can't remember exactly who it was against. It was Jax. But it, it, it never worked. And that's where it goes. Like, look, I appreciate creativity, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily work. But you got to try something against an offense that is just, yeah. frankly, a lot better than you from a talent standpoint. Yep. And I felt ultimately like the defense. Till till they got tired out, had some had some good stops, yeah. had some good moments. Um, and the Eagles' really offense did not seem like they were on right. the same in sync at all. Seemed like that for a while too. It has seemed like that for a while. I'm curious. You know, I don't. Obviously, we'll see what happens with San Francisco losing, and the Eagles still have an uh, have an outside chance, I believe, to get the one seed. So. Um, with Dallas also losing to Miami, but I don't even know if it's going to matter if they're home or away. I don't. I don't really. The way they're playing football right now, the Eagles, they don't look like a Super Bowl team to me. So we'll see what happens there, though, ultimately. But as far as the Giants go in this game, I was thinking on the other side of the ball or on, on sorry, on the on the offensive side of the ball. 
there were some moments I thought I appreciated from uh, just some of the Giants tight ends, Darren Waller and Daniel Bellinger. I know there were some bad moments too. Uh, some people wanted Bellinger to reach out for that first down or, you know, manipulate the space better. But I thought there was a nice play uh, where Bellinger found that seam and really did a good job of catching that intermediate ball. 15, 20, it was like a 15 yard reception at some point. I'm not blanking on when it came. Um, yeah, there it is. You got the tape of it. Perfect. Just a good job understanding space there, the spatial awareness, and then shielding his body once he makes the catch. That was from Tyrod as well. Um, but yeah, and you can see just the, the effortless flick of it. And you, you could just see that when Tyrod's in the game, there are some more vertically oriented options for the Giants in the passing game. It was like that the first game that he played with the New York yep. Giants this season, man. You could see that the possible. game plan was a little bit different than what it was with Daniel Jones. Yeah, I know some, you know, maybe emotionally driven narratives might suggest otherwise, but the tape does show that the Giants had more vertically oriented game plans and plan of attack for when Tyrod was in this season. As a coach, you divine your game plan to the talent you have around it. Absolutely. And I also just appreciate some of the coaching from the offense in this game, because mm -hmm. I don't think it's like the giants got out schemed. There were some guys open. It's just the football wasn't out specifically in the first half a lot and plays like this. Look, you're dialing up four verts from a double Y set. You're going to allow Tyrod to scan. You're going to have Darren Waller expand outside the numbers, take that deep third defender. And now it's on Daniel Bellinger to find the soft spot between the linebacker and the safety. And he did a great job. And I also think whoever that linebacker is, or if it's an apex or whatever it is, number three, it's a pretty poor play by him too, because Tyrod doesn't necessarily like look him off. Like Tyrod's looking to the right, right the entire time. And that's very close, threading the needle. Good throw by Tyrod. That's another thing I like about Tyrod Taylor. He puts some touch on his footballs, man. There are some throws Great where touch. good touch, right? Like catchable footballs for his guys over the defenders. So I like how he is not careless with the football. Yeah, that throw was just the, from a trajectory touch standpoint, just over that defender three, as you can see, but also then to the back shoulder to lead yep. away from the contact. That's exactly as a coach would teach that throw up. Yeah, <laughs> you said throw up, but. That's uh, something about Tyrod Taylor that I've always appreciated. One thing I want to, I know we're jumping around a lot, everybody. Apologies. That kind but of I do, It's that kind of pod, baby. I want to talk about Deontay Banks. Deontay Banks, man, look, they did roll coverage, the Giants, over the top of Xavier McKinney. But if you see some snaps where there wasn't rolled coverage or it was just man coverage in Deontay Banks on A.J. Brown, it's not like Deontay Banks looked like he was in over his head. I'll say that. And he had a couple plays in this game where he – laid the boom, right? There was the yeah. one on the goal line where he kept, was it Kenneth Gainwell out of the end zone? And then he had the great, play. the great effort, just a great effort, manipulating the leverage of the guy, getting lower, resetting himself, and then driving him backwards. And then you had a play where I think it was Jalen Hurts, might have been a design quarterback run, where the Giants just <laughs> couldn't, I don't know what they were doing. I think they were trying to get creative on third down with one of those like chimney type of formations. So no one had the edge and the Eagles were just like, crazy. all right, I'm just going to take it. I'm going to run over yeah. there where no one is. And the only defender on that side was Deontay banks and a wide receiver blocking him. And it's like, Oh God, I'm a rookie cornerback. I got to tackle this 225 pound freak who could squat 600 pounds. And he stuck him and drove him into the ground. And I was like, yo man, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Like he looked he looked good, man. He looked like vintage Adoree Jackson with his tackling. And whereas oh. Adoree didn't really, and there was a lot of missed tackles in this game. Like Michael McFadden missed like oh, three yeah. or four bad ones. I think Adoree missed a couple, but uh, Banks was one that stuck out to me on tape where there was a physicality to him that I really appreciated. I feel like that's been, yeah, and I agree with that. And I feel like he's been pretty physical all season long. He's he's really shown flashes of everything I could want from a Giants corner, except for maybe the ball hawking part. But he's even had some flashes of that, mostly in zone. Yes. But he's had those flashes, despite it, you know, zone, more in zone than man. But still, that's great. Um, I I feel good about where he where he's at in his development and where and what you know where we're at with that draft pick and we'll see what happens because I still think we need a lot more, <laughs> we need a lot more help at corner for what I, if we're going to keep the Wayne Martindale system going um, against you know the good teams, um, but yeah definitely a good mo a good moment for Banks and 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 some and some good tape from him this game. After this season, Dan, who who do we have starting next to Banks? Know. It's going to probably need be to address it. It has probably to be right. No. I'm not comfortable with Flot doing that right now. Me either. That's the other thing I need to see, like, I need to see some development from Flot down the stretch. Personally, I don't know what's going on with Aaron Robinson. At this point, I'm considering him a lost asset. Same, uh, same. I just think Sadly. the injury may have ruined his career 
at this point, like I, the, their swelling, I've last I heard, if you're dealing with this kind of bad swelling 18 months after the surgery or whatever it is, 16, 17 months after, it's not, it can't, it just can't possibly be a good sign. Anything um, we I, get from him is a plus at this point. Like, look, yeah. I think that's how we got to look at Aaron sure. Robinson. Hopefully he can be back next year for yeah. his sake. But they're definitely going to need development out of Flot and next season out of Azudu because that's key core second and third round picks that you invested in. And you just, we saw it with, you know, what Shane inherited. They they really didn't have much from a depth standpoint as far as hitting on some of these first, second, third round picks outside of Lawrence and and uh, Andrew Thomas. And now we can't have that continue with Joe Shane if we want to start winning football games. Um, one thing I do want to talk about with you, though, uh, is the coaching and the game, the in-game coaching. I think it's pretty obvious to anyone who watches the Giants, you don't even have to watch the tape to know this, that they've taken a step back from a coaching standpoint overall this year. I feel like there were some questionable decisions in this game. I feel like for most games, the Giants are just doing things from a coaching standpoint that aren't optimal. Um, not every game this year, but most of their games. I would say this, Nick. And again, these are just opinions. That's part of the show. Um, but I don't feel as confident as I do in Dable as I did last year. And maybe, you know, you know, you could just say, oh, thanks, genius. They were winning games last year and they're not winning games this year. It's pretty obvious. But I feel like some of the mistakes he's made in game coaching wise and some of his decision making has been like objectively worse, independent of winning or losing football games. I don't think that's an unfair statement. I'm trying to think of like the glaring one from this game. Uh, what's the, what is the glaring one from this game? Because I don't know if there was one in this game where I was like, oh, man, that was just absolutely terrible. There's been a few this season that have been like well, that. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if this game is the best example of like. It's probably player. not, but but that's yeah. regard, that's independent of your point, right? Your point still stands. There has been a step back from his in-game coaching, whether that is going for it on fourth down or kicking it or punting it. It, it does seem like there's been a rift. Like here's my example from this game, Nick. Darren Waller makes that catch on that throw on fourth down from Tyrod Taylor Ugh, and he gets up and it doesn't even really look like Waller knows what's going on. If I watch, when I rewatched, it, I thought I saw him opt to like with the timeout motion, not knowing he didn't have any timeouts left. I just feel like, you know, if you're really tuned in as a team at that point, you, everyone is aware of what's going on in that situation. Everyone, not just Saquon. You don't just need Saquon Barkley to bully the ball back from the ref and walk it over. You are just rushing. And I know Waller was hurt on that. He was trying to get a playoff or whatever, but you know, hurt or not, you got to rush that ball back to the official in the middle of the field and to the quarterback. And it's going to be a spike. You don't need to come off the field for that play. I understand was you're he, hurt now. Was he concussed? Cause he was like not hurt. Like he wasn't hit really. It didn't seem like it. Maybe, maybe he was and I'm mistaken, but from the video, uh -huh. it didn't look like the hit was was all that hard. And I'm not like, you know, trying to, trying to say anything uh, contentious about Darren Waller, but it was just a very confusing and odd situation. Maybe he thought he had a timeout because I, I thought maybe he, he was like, he went like this on the ground at one point. Cause I thought that he was hurt, but then I saw him on the next play and I was like, well, how injured were you? Like, did something right. happen? Did he get his bell wrong? So I was just very confused and maybe, maybe he did think he had a timeout and look, ultimately, yes, that would fall on, on Dable. You got to, but like, does it at the same time? Like, I understand, yeah, like, fair. yeah, like you got to make Maybe sure everybody's on the same page, but it's like, dude, this is a veteran, one of the better tight ends of this generation. And he didn't know that you didn't have a timeout. And on fourth and eight that you came down with this awesome catch. If that's a situation, I mean, I'm willing to believe that he was just something happened. Maybe he was injured, had his bell rung. I'm, I'm not certain, but I was like, what the hell is going on? Like get the football up and spike it. And yeah, <laughs> it was just, it was just wild. But they were, dude, yeah. But to your point, I, I think you're spot on with, with losing a little bit of faith in Brian Dable's ability to coach in-game, not just because of the final product, though. Yeah, not just because of the final product, just because of individual things. And, and, and you know, it's been a trying year for him, obviously, and so yes. we'll see what happens when he gets the reset next year. Um, How about the regard. officiating in this game, dude? Oh, the officiating was bad in Yo, this it game. It was bad, bro. It was bad. It was, it was big, that big, group. Big Steve was throwing a fit, bro. Oh, is that your daddy? No, your brother? <laughs> no, 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 that's my dad. Yeah, Big okay. Steve. Little yeah. Steve is my brother. Yeah. Little Steve is the brother. Okay. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, it was bad. I feel like with me and officiating these days, Nick, I'm just like the officiating is so inconsistently bad across the NFL 
that I don't like to pinpoint the times it doesn't go the Giants way. I think there are times it does go the Giants way too, and we just don't yes. remember those as much. It's always like it. It always leads me back to what you know the famous saying for every uh, diehard you know true poker player is: you always remember your bad beats, but you never remember the times where you bad beat the other player. You only yeah. remember the times where it went against you, and that's pretty much how it feels to me in general as a fan of football. But I do think in general the officiating is having just a, a, a downright awful season. Um, yeah, if you know, there needs to be something done at this point about the officiating because it's impacting the games. It's impacting fans enjoyment, in my opinion, at this point. And, you know, is there any kind of sign of hope for a bunch of 60 year olds trying to run around and catch up with these 25 year old greatest athletes in the world? I doubt it. I don't think there's any hope for these guys, to be completely honest. It really feels to me like we need to go to AI officiating at some point very soon. Like Jeez, we want good officiating. That's how we get it. That's crazy. We're deferring to these people. These people. See, I'm already referring to them as people. We're screwed, bro. No, but another topic for another podcast. To, to the Giants and the Giants, but yeah, I'm not blaming obviously the officials. It's just it no, seemed like there were a lot of it's non, like watch, the, yeah. the Wandale Robinson, and maybe if the ball was placed a little the bit JMS better, would have got penalty. called. The JMS penalty was weird, but I think the worst one was the Bobby Okereke one. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, I get it. Like people hang on, and you you're you're very cognizant of it at that point with the clock ticking down. They didn't have a timeout, but the end game was Jalen Hurts. The ball was a fumble, and he thought he was. Recovering it was a fumble. fumble. Yeah. It was a fumble, right, and. Jalen Hurts got rewarded for making a stupidest, the stupidest thing right. The that stupidest decision. No one should That's be rewarded. Like the clock runs no out. One no one should be rewarded. Even if that. Bobby Okereke hung on him a little bit longer than, than normal, I think it would have been okay because you were yeah. dumb enough to cut that back inside. You should be right. punished like Terrence Williams right. was when the Giants beat the beat, beat Dallas oh, in week Cowboys, one of 2016. Yeah. So to me, man, like I hated that they got rewarded for that. I just it was very undeserved. That's fair, and I completely agree with that statement. But you know, it ended up happening and, and it did it, and the officials did make an impact on this game in a negative way. I think that's obvious for anyone who watched it. Yeah, I'm sure that there are Eagle fans out there who would be like, there was a hold on that play. It's like, all right, guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can find that with every play. Yeah, every, every play. There was a there was a play in this game where where the Eagles ran counter, and they ran GT counter, meaning they pulled their backside guard and their backside tackle. What the Giants were doing to play counter uh, when they had these five-man fronts was they would bring that apex defender or whoever it was to the to the play side down aggressively to kind of help as a secondary force defender, which, you know, makes sense. But that poor player was Cordell Flott in one of these plays. And I don't know if you know this tackle by the name of Jordan Maialata, who's about six foot eight, 300 and, I don't know, like 40 pounds or something, steamed right over Cordell Flott. I don't know if you saw that. And I was it's like, such oh. a bad matchup. Yeah, I, was I like, saw Oh, that. my it's God, that's just horrible. The Poor yeah. guy, man. But good, you know, kudos on him to have the cojones to be like, all right, here we go. You know, I got to take square this up. And the other yeah. guy, square <laughs> up, bro. <laughs> we did. Yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on, on this game? Nah, this, this was a, this was disappointing. Um, nothing, nothing too bad. I, I would say this, and we'll have a podcast before next week. I, I want to see some individuals on the defensive side of the football step up a little bit more against mm -hmm. a team that's really vying for a victory. Look, I know the Rams sure. are they're hot right now. Like they're a hot football team. They're playing good football, but they just took beat the crap out of the Saints, but now they're coming to your building. You were just on a two-game road trip. Try to try to pull the upset off against a desperate team. And uh, I want to see some from Kayvon. I want to see some from Aziz. I want to see some from the secondary pieces because they're going to have their hands full cuz Puka Nakua, Cooper Cup, Demarcus Robinson now. They they're all just playing very good football. I think Sean McVay is also really in his bag this year. I mean, I there know, were people man. questioning McVay. Felt like for a while, in some ways, he got a little bit stale with his, in my opinion, with his play calling within his system. I think he just relied on what was working for a while. And then he reinvented himself, in my opinion, from what I've seen on tape this year, reinvented what they can do with Stafford in a lot of ways. Now, having Puka helps, like finding a Puka helps him do that because he tried to go with Allen Robinson. It didn't work. And he really hadn't had that since Robert Woods was on the team with Cup. But now that he's got yeah. that, like I, in my personal opinion, I think he's going to destroy Wink system. I just think it's going to be lighting them up. Stafford's going to light them up. Now the cold weather could help. MetLife Stadium wind could help take away the passing game. I felt like the wind was definitely impacting the the Eagles Giants game to some degree, not a large degree, but just colder weather, windier. If this was in LA, I think Stafford would be going 300 plus to be honest against this scheme right now. But you know, maybe like you said, we'll get some great individual performance from Giants defenders. I'm looking for Flot to have a little bit more of a positive arrow up rest of season for sure, among other players on that defense. 
Jeez, best of luck covering those two. Those no, guys are really. crazy, man. Especially with Cup Stafford, and dude. Stafford's so freaking underrated. It's just it's one of them. Mm. Yo, dude, during the pandemic, I remember for Sports Illustrated, I wrote an article about like the most underrated players of the decade. He was the quarterback. Cast him. Matt, just all film. It's like Matt Stafford. And this is before he won the Super Bowl. So it wasn't, you know, this is when he was on the Lions. I was like, dude, this guy is like legit very good. Like a very good quarterback yes. who's just been toiling away in Detroit. Made and- Penny a holiday. Yeah. Made yeah. Marvin Jones. Because um, King King made King has King made so many receivers over his career. Like, yeah, Puka's awesome, but is he this awesome? Or is part of it that he has a quarterback who's a completely underrated mental processor post snap with a generational arm? That's what it is. It's a generational arm. He changes arm angles. He changes arm slots. He has better velocity than 95% of the quarterbacks. And he has great ball placement too. That's a generational arm with good processing skills. That's what I want a quarterback for the Giants eventually. Get me that. Find 30, a way. He's 35 you know, years old. Oh, get wow. me that. Get me something like that, please, at some point, so I can watch we, those throws for my team. We want our balls placed optimally. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. What a great way to end this podcast today. Um, thank you for tuning into the Big Blue Banter Show. It's been a wild season. It's been a depressing year, let's be honest. But True. the good news is you've stuck with us this long. And you still like our analysis. And you like our takes. And more good takes are coming. Because our best content comes in draft season. That's how it is for this football team. Now, you could argue that our best content may have come last year when the Giants were actually good. And I'd say, yeah, the highest ceiling is when the Giants are good. But the reality of the situation is we've had some bad years. So, it's time to really eat during the offseason, during draft season. That's how I view it, Nick. And I'm excited to get into the prospects, most of whom we'll watch and evaluate and tell you about. Giants won't draft, but it is fun when they do end up drafting those guys that you evaluate. Deontay Banks made my final mock draft last year as the Giants pick. They end up taking him. Nick and I spent podcasts worth on him. We did talk about him in the mock draft preview. We talked about him on his own individual podcast. And then obviously we do the tape once they draft that player. And so it's a lot of fun when it does work out. And I'll be excited, Nick, to get in some quarterback tape with you this offseason because you're going to, I'm going to make you watch some Jaden Daniels. I'm going to make you watch it. I'm going to, I'm not, not going to say make you, I know you want to, but I'm, when I say make, I mean, I'm going to be pushing my ass off for all quarterback to him. And you're going to have to, you know, barrel me down and, and talk me off the ledge of let's watch some receivers too. Let's watch some offensive tackles too, because ultimately the giants may not end up going quarterback uh, defensive end and edges. Edge too. We're going to have to watch some edges too. And the other part about this, we don't even know who the coaches are going to be. We don't know what coaches uh, are going to get canned, what coaches are going wink. to get other jobs. It might not be wink. It might not be calf. That, that might change some things, especially on the defensive side. It will. It will. There's a lot to get to. I'm excited for the off season for it to finally be here. This has been a, it, it's been a rough, it's been a rough final stretch. I would say of the giant season, at least we got that DeVito run of just like, again, short term, but at least it gave us some joy for a short, you know, just something like, you know, after that Packers game, I felt like, yeah, Oh, maybe this team could actually do it. It was short lived. The saints destroyed the giants, but you know, you felt like maybe they got some juice. Um, I'm looking for the offseason where I'll, I'll feel like I get my mojo back. And I know you will as well, Nick, when we're evaluating the future. And as everyone always says in the offseason, spring hopes. Is it spring hopes eternal or eternal? What is it? What's that line? Yeah, spring hopes eternal. Spring hopes, hopes eternal for the New York football giants. Um, and so we'll, 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 we'll lean on that as we move forward here. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to you soon.